We are Dream Warriors. My name is Cristina Jimenez, and I'm the managing director of the United We Dream Network, and I am honored and humbled to be here in front of you today in our largest Congress to date, 600 Dreamers. I mean, I'm shaking, not because I'm nervous, but because of the power that I can feel in this room with all of you, 600 leaders of our network here. Today, United We Dream is the largest immigrant youth-led network in the United States. We have 47 affiliates, many of you here, in over 20 states across the country. We are a membership-led organization. What does that mean? It means that you, our leaders, make decisions about this network, what we fight for, how we fight for them, and how we grow and build power. It's a big responsibility, but we're here. All of you get to elect the leadership of this network. In every Congress, we elect our board members and our national coordinating committee members. How many of you are looking forward to the elections? Raise your hand. You better be checking out the profiles of the people that are running on the website, all right? Be prepared for those elections, be informed voters. <laughs> and so, why are we here today? Why did all of you drove here or took a plane, maybe for the first time? If you took a plane for the first time, raise your hand. Woo! Woo! <laughs> courage, courage, right? Undocumented and unafraid, that's right. But to understand why we're here today, we need to also understand where we come from and how we got here to have 600 dreamers in one room in Kansas City, Missouri. Who would have thought about that? <laughs> it's my first time here. Thank you for hosting us, Kansas City. And so I'm going to share my story with you because through my story, I'm going to be sharing the story of United We Dream and the story of this movement. When I was 19, or 17 actually, when I was in high school, like many of you, it was a moment of injustice that agitated me to get into this fight. I was walking down the hallway to see my college advisor and I was really nervous because I needed to get my college application signed off by the advisor before I would mail it. And I was nervous because I didn't have a social security number or a green card. But I walked in and she asked me, where's your social, where's your green card? And I said, I have none of them. And then she asked me, how about your parents? And I said, my parents don't have that either. And she said, I'm sorry, Christina. I cannot sign off this application and you can't go to school. It was a painful moment. How many of you remember that painful moment when someone told you that you couldn't go to college because you didn't have papers? Raise your hand. I feel your pain. We went through this together at some point or another. So I cried my way home, and I was talking to my mom about this. And I said, you know what, mom? I need to accept my reality. I don't have papers, and I'm ready to give up because I worked so hard to go to college, and now I can't go. So I'm gonna go and try to find a job at the local supermarket, and I'm gonna help you out. That's what I told my mom. And my mom listened, but she was shocked. And she was like, Christina, you want to give up? And she reminded me of the sacrifice. She said to me, your dad and I sacrificed so much to come to this country, leaving everything behind, working every day, weekends, nights, mornings, 
to pull you through school and for you to become the first person in our family to go to college and you're gonna give up? She said to me, don't be a coward. Now you're gonna go back into that office and you're going to tell the college advisor to sign that form. She said, al carajo with what she said. That's what she told me, I'm quoting her. You remember your moms, right? Yeah, I see the visual. <laughs> and she said, and if she doesn't do it, I'm willing to go there myself and get it done. <laughs> strong moms, strong women. And so I did, I was like, mom, don't worry. You don't have to go, don't worry. You don't have to go to school. You know, you're a high school student. You're gonna get embarrassed if your mom goes to school. And I went. And I got my form signed off and I mailed my application. But see, what my mom said to me was because she's a woman that is very grounded on faith. And she said to me, I have faith. Don't worry about the money. You're going to school. And I was reminded of that faith one week before I started college because New York passed the in-state tuition bill that allowed me to pay for school. How many of the New Yorkers here remember that moment? Woo, right? And my mom and I were watching the news and we're like, oh, this is a miracle. Oh my God, one week before? Wow. But you know what? It was not a miracle fully. It wasn't because I was benefiting from the work of advocates and students that had been pushing for an in-state tuition bill in New York for years. And without me knowing, in many other states, advocates that wanted to fight for students to go to college were doing the same. In Utah, in Washington, in Nebraska, in Kentucky, in Massachusetts. Wow, they were all doing this and I didn't know. And so, you know, I was not always this outspoken dreamer talking to 600 people in front of me. I was not always this way. And in fact, when I was 19, I was very afraid. Afraid of sharing my story. I was afraid because I did not want to put myself and my family at the risk of being deported. And I was so afraid that I, when I shared my story for the first time in a very small event in New York, I said, the only way I'm gonna share my story is if I change my name to Sandra and I say that I'm from Costa Rica and not from Ecuador because I wanted to hide my identity. I was a closeted dreamer. How many, how many of you identify with that? Raise your hand. Yep. But you know why was I afraid? Because our country was going through a tremendous anti-immigrant wave. Our families were watching the news every night and we will see and hear the reports about massive workplace rates. In Massachusetts, Bedford, 300 mothers and fathers were detained in the middle of the day and put in deportation proceedings, leaving all of their children in school behind with no one to pick them up. I was hearing of the reports of ICE coming into the homes of our community and detaining mothers and fathers, breaking families apart. And to put the cherry on top, in 2006, a Republican Congress member from Wisconsin introduced a bill called the Censor Branner Bill. How many of you have heard about that? Raise your hand. Not many of us, it's okay, I'll tell you what's it about. This bill aimed to criminalize you and me and our parents and our families for being in this country without papers. And it would have made people at church and schools and other places that interacted with undocumented folks criminals. That's what this bill was trying to do. And that galvanized people to take on, on the streets 
And that's why in 2006, you saw massive marches of immigrants all across the country. Do you remember that? Power. But you see, that fear that I had changed in 2006. The threat of deportation hit my life closely, on my face. My friend, and now my husband, Walter, was detained in an Amtrak train as he was heading to Chicago to a national immigrant youth meeting that he had organized because we were coming together to put our plan to pass the Dream Act in 2006. And he got detained and put in deportation proceedings. And I got the call at three in the morning and the first feeling that I had was a feeling of guilt. And you may wonder why. I felt guilty because I was supposed to be in that train with him. And I told him I was too afraid to travel. And I said to Walter, you go and you represent New York in this meeting. I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid to travel. I was supposed to be in that train with him. And I felt guilty because I left him alone. But the fact that he was detained and that I, that I was facing the risk of not seeing him ever again was what infused me with courage. And I got rid of my fear. And I said, fuck all of this. Because I did not want anyone in my family or any other friend to go through the experience that Walter went through. And thank But you know, when he got detained, all of the leaders that were coming to this meeting, Julieta Garibay from Texas, Josh Bernstein from DC, Carlos from Massachusetts, we all got together in the call. We did not know what the fuck to do. We were crying half of the time. Like, what do we do? Walter is detained. Oh my God, what do we do? But see, that moment that led me to overcome my fear led me to fully commit to this fight. And I said, I'm going to throw myself to this fight fully with my soul, my heart, and my body. And you see what was my next step? I was so afraid to share my story publicly that I came out on the newspaper in El Diario, New York. <laughs> See, in those days, we didn't have the dreamer word. Like, none of us identify ourselves as dreamers. It wasn't cool to be a dreamer. So, you know, there you can see the headline. It says, Indocumentada. And I often think, like, if this was published today, it will say Soñadora. And it will be so much nicer. <laughs> but it was that moment that changed my life. And now, look how far we've come. Look, we have 600 people, 47 affiliates. We're organized. We are running end campaigns and stopping deportation of dreamers like nothing. What? I never would have thought of that, right? And we organized ourselves and we decided to push for the DREAM Act. And in 2010, we got the bill to be voted in the House, winning a historical vote in the House of Representatives. We fell in the Senate, and it was painful, right? How many of you remember when we saw the, the DREAM Act failing his vote? It was painful. But we came together to Memphis, Tennessee in early 2011, and we decided that this vote was not going to kill our spirit, our warrior spirit. And we decided to keep on fighting. And we said, okay, you know what? We're going to push to stop the deportation of dreamers. And it doesn't matter all the people that tell us that we cannot do this. You know, a lot of people told us, you're crazy. Is stopping deportations? You can't do that. We said, fuck that. We're going to show you what's possible. <laughs> right? Right? 
And on June 15, all of the organizing that you and I and this movement together did led us to the victory of the fair action. Brothers and sisters, this is the biggest victory of the immigrant community in the history of this country since 1986. This is major. Okay, take that in, take that in. Do you own this victory? Raise your hand. Are you proud of this victory? Yes. But I know that this was a bitter and sweet moment because as we celebrate it, I remember that my mom and my dad, and my tios, and mis tias, and mis primos, and mis primas, were still at the risk of deportation. And I knew that many brothers and sisters in this room were not eligible for DACA anyway. So it was painful. So is DACA enough? No! I didn't hear that. Is DACA enough? No! Are we gonna settle for DACA? Of course not. Of course not. So what's next? Where do we go from here? All right. Well, so that's why we're here. To talk about where we go and what we do. And what's the next fight? What's the next fight about? And see, when I look back, I think of the most successful tool that we've used in our movement. And that's sharing our stories. It's powerful, just like I'm doing right now, right? We change hearts and minds. But, you know, let me share something with you. Every time I share my story, I felt weird because I never talked about my mom and my dad and my family and all of the sacrifices and the fact that my dad drives a scared shedless every day to work because he doesn't have a license. And didn't talk about the struggles of my mom either. Because you know what? When I started to do this work, I got talking points. And the talking points were, I'm Cristina Jimenez. I'm from Ecuador. My parents brought me to this country. I want to be a lawyer. I'm an honor student. I want to contribute to this country. Please pass the DREAM Act. Do you remember when you got the talking points? Just like that. Raise your hand. Right? But see now, the choice that we have in front of us is that we can write our own story. Right? We can be the authors of that story. Are you willing to write a new story with me today? And this weekend? Raise your hand. Say it again. Are you willing to write a new story? And what does... What, what that story looks like. Now I want to invite you to close your eyes and I'm going to ask you to imagine because that new story is going to talk about our power. The power that we're building. It's going to talk about the effective implementation of deferred action and it's going to talk about the unprecedented opportunity that we have to engage our parents, our cousins, our abuelitos, abuelitas, our cousins, our friends, our neighbors in this fight. Imagine your membership meeting with 30 people. In growing power, your membership meeting is going to be 50, 60 people. Imagine when you mobilize for that action, when you had only 100 people showing up. Imagine 500 people showing up for an action. Are you liking this? Are you liking what we're imagining together? So are you willing to build power together? Are you willing to build a dream nation full of dream warriors? Great. So now with that spirit of warriors, we're going to get focused on how we define our next fight. And how are we going to win it? So this weekend, we are here because we're going to accomplish the goals that you see right in front of you. 
They're easy. We're going to be here three days. We're dreamers, so we can always reach the impossible. So don't feel overwhelmed by these goals. So first, we want to celebrate our victory. Woo! Victories! Right? Second, we want to re-energize ourselves. Because I know we've been leading clinics, knocking on doors, collecting pledges. We're tired. I get that. So we're going to re-energize this weekend to be ready for the next fight. We're going to honor the new leadership that's coming to this Congress. Raise your hand again. Who's here for the first time in this Congress? Welcome. We honor your leadership. We're going to be honoring also leadership that has served and that is transitioning. But most importantly, we're going to decide together on the direction of United We Dream and how we're going to win that fight. And I'm not talking about a bill or a legislation. It's not about that. It's about fucking dreaming. It's about the finding that vision, that change that we want to see in our communities. That's at the core of what we are deciding on this weekend. 